Sometimes I feel like my students just aren't curious enough. Find out about the literature and film from cultures other than yours. Go to museums and look at stuff. Be curious. Follow the design blogs. They're good. Read AIGA Eye on Design. It's really opening up new territory and any new resource that helps uh, students, faculty, practitioners have a broader understanding of what design is, where it comes from, what it can include, is really positive and I support every effort in that direction. <laughs> Joining us for this episode of the podcast is Ellen Lupton. Ellen Lupton is Senior Curator of Contemporary Design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City, where recent projects have included Beauty, Cooper Hewitt Design Terennial, How Posters Work, Beautiful Users, and Graphic Design, now in production. As Director of the Graphic Design MFA Program at Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, Lupton has authored and edited numerous books on design processes, Many of them in collaboration with graduate students, including Thinking with Type, Type on Screen, Graphic Design Thinking, and Graphic Design The New Basics with Jennifer Cole Phillips. She has also been a contributor to numerous publications such as Print, I, ID, Metropolis, and The New York Times. Ellen received her BFA from the Cooper Hewitt Union in 1985, and she received her doctorate in Communication Design from the University of Baltimore in 2008. We hope you enjoy this episode of Design D-Dog's podcast where Ellen Lupton talks to us about her passion for writing, research, women in graphic design, as well as diversity in graphic design. Once again, welcome everyone back to another episode of Design D-Dog's podcast where creating success in design education is what we are aiming for. And uh, today we are joined by Ellen Lupton. And obviously, as I mentioned in the previous podcast episode, Mandy is here with us and she's going to be um, my partner in crime for about 10 episodes or, or more uh, as we work on this wonderful topic about women in graphic design. But before we get into that really quickly, Ellen, welcome to the, to the podcast. We are so grateful for having you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. That means a lot to us. And... Um, before we get too far into the discussion, um, can you give us a little bit of background on yourself, how you got into um, teaching design uh, and, and what that all looked like? Sure. I really started my career as a design curator, both at uh, Cooper Union, where I went to school, and then at Cooper Hewitt, the museum, the Smithsonian Museum in the Upper East Side of New York. And those are kind of teaching roles because you are creating content about design for the public. Uh, but I really then wanted to get into classroom teaching and having a more hands-on relationship with students and came to MICA in Baltimore in 1997, so <laughs> over 20 years ago, oh, wow. and have continued to be a curator. So it's really like teaching in multiple registers. Yeah. So... How, I mean, there was that moment where you're like, yeah, you know, I'm going to try this. What, was there something that just clicked with you that made you just go, oh my gosh, there was nothing like that? Or did you have a moment like that? Well, I had always done some adjunct teaching even before I came to MICA. So I feel like teaching was always in my blood. Uh, my parents are both college teachers. My twin sister is a college teacher. So it wasn't oh, wow. like a a huge leap for me to go from curating to teaching it just seemed but it was really hard i think i would say it was harder than i expected it to be oh wow and, sometime i'd love to you, hear more on that yeah and how do you balance those roles because you're still curating while you're teaching well you just can't waste any time you know because they're both very demanding and you just have to um really manage your time well so that you can fulfill multiple functions in life yeah. <laughs> it and, is hard and i think i'll add to that complexity too is because you you really found a passion for type which i hope to have an opportunity to ask you a small question before we conclude today just on on your passion with type and my passion with type and it um yeah so type is no little 
aspect of design, it's it's very demanding. So to even have that passion in typography as well. Yeah, I love typography because I'm a writer. And to me, typography and writing are just joined at the hip. That yeah. it's typography was invented in order to make language more accessible and reproducible for human consumption. So as a writer and being fascinated with graphic design, that's really where the rubber meets the road for me. Just every sure. day, yeah. you know, every day. Man, I could talk to you for the next 10 hours <laughs> about those, those things. Um, yeah, Mandy, would you like to kind of talk a little bit about the documentary film then? Right. Um, well, first of all, thank you for your help um, in this documentary film and, and being so gung-ho and on board when we asked you to be involved in your participation. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, why you would be interested in being involved in this project or, you know, more broadly, your interest in the topic of women in graphic design history? Well, I teach graphic design history, and I have to say, it is not easy to uh, broaden and diversify the story of our profession. Um, I think the profession itself is based on um, a certain economic development and the Industrial Revolution and these very uh, colonialist, uh, capital-intensive developments in human history that were um, exclusionary of, of women and people of color and indigenous people. Um, and so it's really tough to um, open up that story. And so anything that, any new resource that helps uh, students, faculty, practitioners have a broader understanding of what design is, where it comes from, what it can include, is really positive and I support every effort in that direction. <laughs> well, we thank you for that. Um, also, I think it's important to note that, you know, we, we had planned to do uh, film a short to promote the documentary this, uh, this summer and that fell through with the pandemic. Um, but I think that Pete and I are both really excited about this time that it's allowing us to regroup and talk to people more in depth about the planning stages of the documentary film. Um, so I'm really excited to ask you my next question, which is what topics do you think a documentary film about women in graphic design history should cover? Um, I think it's really important to look at how women have been involved behind the scenes in graphic design. So I think the wonderful film uh, Graphic Matters <laughs> is a really good uh, model for that because so much of production work was done by women. So paste up art and typesetting, these were fields where women had a big role to play. And if you look through old design magazines, even like old Swiss magazines, <laughs> you'll see like photographs of, of women as part of the workforce in the graphic arts. So that's one thing that I think is really important. And then, of course, um, identifying uh, individual women who made contributions um, is super important. Um, and I know you're looking at that. So there's kind of like the industry, um, the sort of sociology of the industry. There's the individual practitioners that should be called out and um, acknowledged. But also, I think sometimes a, um, a broadening of the definition of what graphic design is. Um, so mm -hmm. should it include um, some practices like Madam C.J. Walker, who created the wonderful uh, empire of African-American hair care products. There's a whole movie about her on Netflix right now, a series. Like that to me is graphic design adjacent because she built a brand that was, mm -hmm. was and is yeah. very powerful. So sometimes um, the very definition of graphic design uh, ends up excluding certain practices that are very interesting and are very related to what we do. To to elaborate on that, um, for example, we're going to be having an opportunity to talk to Libby Meggs. And Libby Meggs had an executive role 
in design and Virginia's for lovers is, is a campaign she was very responsible for. So even to that, to that end, do you think there's a lot of discussion also on, you know, women that held those executive roles that really didn't get any recognition um, for their work? I think that's a fascinating question to be asking um, that women were often involved in the business side um, of a famous organization. You know, there's that saying behind every great man is a woman <laughs> doing the laundry, raising the kids, you know, right. making a safe space for daddy to work. Right. Um, or, or making and, global campaigns. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other relevant issues that you think we need to talk about in this documentary film? Well, I think the question of diversity, ethnic, racial diversity, um, out non-Western, um, looking beyond Europe, is uh, is really important, and I, I hope that you'll address that. Yeah. So one of the um, designers we're going to be talking to is a type designer, Nisa, uh, Nina Stossinger. I don't know if you've uh, met mm -hmm. Nina. She is a wonderful, pleasant person. Uh, to talk to. She just lights up a room when she comes in. And she's actually designing the typeface that we're using in the visual branding for um, for the film. Uh, it's one of the typefaces she designed. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, Nina is from Germany, right? So where do we, having a documentary film on women of graphic design in America does there does there become a a question of well there in Nina's um um but she's working case, in the US yeah right? she's working in the US yeah. right so so is there is there potential concerns that somebody might say well well she's not an american designer you know and we've also had the the discussion of of even location new york to la you know and and what does that look like any thoughts on on that kind of uh, discussion? You're not trying to uh, have diversity in terms of geographic location. I think that's re that's really important if you can do that is to um, include designers from Milwaukee, Chicago, um, New Orleans, you know, different yeah. parts of the world, different parts of the country. And and we definitely want to um, even talk about you know ethnicity and and how much ethnicity plays a role in women and design and, and what ethnicity is brought into it. And that's almost a whole nother documentary film in amongst itself uh, is, is that complication in, in graphic design history and even in the profession uh, alone. That's the uh, nature of any research though, right? Anytime you dig into research, there's always more avenues that you can go down and more, more questions to ask. And, and as a curator, have there been any potential uh, hurdles that you've had to overcome even trying to either add something into the collection or even trying to find uh, resources? And is there a, a large representation, do you think, of women in graphic design uh, through your length doing that? Okay, so your question about. Um, yeah, resources. So, you know, museums don't necessarily have big collections of material by women or African American designers or Latino designers. And museums are, you know, now realizing what a terrible mistake that has been historically and that we have to start uh, doing better and finding that things from the past as well as pieces being made now and adding them to our collections for future curators, historians, yeah. researchers. And you just don't know what's going to be valued in the future what, and what the values of the future will be. So we have to kind of right. um, address our values now and make sure that we're acting on them. Absolutely. So is is there is there additional concerns right do you see any problems or difficulties now i'm i'm going to uh, 
give you a little bit of context too is Mandy and I joined um, um, Design History Fridays. I think that's the name of it, mm -hmm. um, Design History Fridays. And um, it, it was interesting because one of the questions that was proposed to me was, you know, why you, right? And Mandy and I have had this discussion and I've had a discussion with Diane Gibbs from the University of South Alabama as well, because I've been thinking about this idea for a very, very long time in doing the documentary film. And I remember talking with Diane Gibbs and telling her about this idea and, you know, man, I should really, yeah, I really want to do it. I really, I always think about it. And she's like, well, why aren't you doing it? You know, that's exactly what she said to me. And I was like, well, am I the guy to do it? She goes, why aren't you the guy to do it? And I said, I don't know. So it came up in that uh, Design History Friday discussion. You know, somebody said, well, why are you doing it? And I didn't, I didn't have an answer, you know, um, because it's time is my answer. Because I feel it needs to be done and I'm going for it. Thanks to Diane, you know, saying, just do it. So, you know, here I am. That's one problem that I've already seen. And I have a feeling there might be more of that kind of discussion. It's like, well, why is this male, this, you know, guy who teaches a history of graphic design class, all of a sudden be that guy? Any thoughts on that? And I will say that's one reason why I reached out to Mandy and Diane Gibbs actually told me because my other part was like, I don't know if I could do this on my own. I'm very nervous, you know, I, it, so well, I reached out to Mandy. She's been a blessing. She's amazing. Huge talent. Um, it is really important that you have women on your team. Yes. You know, I, I think those questions are legitimate. And it's really important if your project is uh, celebrating the creativity of women and the voice of women, that their voice is part of the making of your film. So I think you're doing the right thing there. Yeah, I, I would not try this with without that support uh and i've even you know made that decision where um i i even asked mandy you know will you be that you know air quotes narrative voice of the documentary film like she's going to be in it i'm going to be interviewing her you won't hear my voice but you know she'll be adding to that discussion and that commentary and she will be, almost become that that guiding personality that's going to take you through uh, through the film, um, and I, I'm so lucky. I'm so fortunate, um, and the the amount of um, support we have is just uh, outstanding. It's booming. Um, what are there other problems in the context of, of of this that you think that should be thought about? Um, well, I think, it, again, I think it's important to look at kind of the sociology or the systemic nature of the field of graphic design and what we create in society, yeah. as well as the individuals. So there was a really good article recently on AIGA Ion Design by Aggie Toppins about trying to teach history of graphic design as not just a bunch of heroes and heroines. Yes, I remember that article, but, yeah. Yeah, it was very good. So I think that's something to um, to look at, you know. I actually think you'll be pleased to hear that we've actually contacted her and we're gonna be interviewing her for this series. That's great, she's amazing. So yeah. to get some of that critical point of view, that it isn't just biographies, but also people talking yeah, and, about the history more critically. Right, and, and we know, you know, the history of graphic design, Philip Meggs, and how substantial that text has been for decades uh, in the classroom. And um, I don't think that text should go away. And, um, you know, what, what's it, what's its next edi edition, uh, the seventh edition? And we were actually in discussion with Elizabeth Meggs, and um, she actually would like us to uh, reach out to, uh, if I'm drawing a blank on the name right now, I don't know if Mandy's uh I want to say Sandra. Gathering. Yeah, I think Sandy that's right. Max, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Uh She's and, my and we're going to get Micah. Oh, wow. is she? Oh, okay. Yeah, we're definitely going to be reaching out to her, so maybe you want to give her kind of a Oh, by the way. <laughs> um, she would love to hear from you. I'm that'll sure. be fantastic. Um so so what I'm leading to is um we have 
had that text for a very long time. And it, the history of graphic design classes have almost been a, a heroes and uh, heroines or however you want to say that, right? And, and how that comes about. I've talked with Mandy about my history of graphic design course. And I had Roger Remington as a, as a history professor. Uh, and what a great stoic man he was. But I think back and it's like, yeah, that's kind of, kind of how it was. It was all about the heroes, you know? Um, the pioneers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The pioneers. And, and it's, it's good to see that, that change. Word, like, oh no, <laughs> settlers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They came with their, with their backpacks of crayons and mm -hmm, their guns. Uh, photographic <laughs> blue pencils. Um, so I, so I'm glad that you bring that up about moving away from that, you know, talk about the heroes and talk about um, its, its social impact and, and how it can change. Mm -hmm. And there's no better time than now to really talk about right. the impact of design and, and how it can change um, society and the communities we live in. Right. And, and talking about how we can change that dynamic um, and, and promoting discussions like Aggie's article and, and how we can achieve that. Hey, Mandy has a, has a really great question um, about some of your research. So I'm going to let, let Mandy kind of ask you that. Um, so I am interested in knowing a little bit more about your research. And if you could tell us a little bit about some of your ongoing or past research and how it might tie into this project. Sure. I've been working on a book for the last two years called Extra Bold. Um, I don't know what the subtitle is yet, but it's going to be a, a feminist and inclusive guide for graphic design that includes um, theory and history, not comprehensively, but more to show right. the range of what history can be and that everybody can help make it, you know, that you can make the design history of your own community. Um, and also kind of workplace ideas about empowerment and uh, something we call confidence equity. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, how to, um, to make a more inclusive workplace. So I've been researching a lot, uh, looking at the history of, of women and underrepresented groups in, in design and how to tell some of those stories. And also what are some of the theoretical questions around feminism and binary thinking, um, some of the sort of dominant tropes, right, of Western intellectual structure <laughs> is very yeah. interesting. So we're trying to do a whole lot with this book. Um, yeah. And it's, it's challenging. You know, you, you run into the complexity of feminism, for example. Right which often when we say feminism really is white feminism. It's white women looking for pay equity in uh, male dominated professions. Um, and that movement um, was actually damaging to women of color who uh, were already working, but they were working in service roles and different capacity. So looking at this history requires a lot of self-examination, you know, as right. we're seeing as a nation and as a world now with Black Lives Matter, that, um, you know, each question you ask about empowering women and finding um, the place of women in history opens up other questions about exclusion and um, white supremacy and, uh, the, the burden of responsibility we have to all address the privilege. that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's going to um, be interesting, interesting as, as we get into those discussions too, how um, the different designers will start adding uh, dialogue and continuing to grow that discussion. Uh, you know, we have you as our, as our first interview uh, for the podcast as we start looking at, you know, what what areas are we focusing in? Make sure we haven't forgotten something. Where does our research need to be focused? And I'm, I'm sure as those discussions continue to build, we're going to just get this list of, of, of different things that to be aware of, you know. And when we start seeing those, like you say, you know, what, what door is that going to open or what path is that going to lead us down? Um, and it's very... It's going to be very difficult, and and we even know 
um, we're looking at the the text Women of Graphic Design by Armin Witt and uh, Byron Gomez last name. I have a problem with trying to figure out her last name. Uh, Palacio, apologies. Say it again for me. Pal Palacio. Palacio. Okay. I'm just guessing. Yeah. Byron, forgive us. <laughs> but they even talk about the the difficulties of of trying to get the information uh, and trying to get that wealth out there, and it's very difficult. And Mandy and I have even talked about, um, you know, what will be the number of folks that we're going to have an opportunity to have a discussion with. Uh, for a documentary film, you're really limited, and you know, this documentary film could, uh, you know, at, as we've talked, could be three hours. It could be a series, and it could, you know. <laughs> Um, there's just so much to get to. So it's a very difficult thing to try to find an hour and a, hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half, you know, and try to try to get that in. Well, I'm the, this there new, you. this new book project sounds very exciting. Do you have a publication date for it yet? Yeah, we're hoping it will come out in spring 2021, but it might be summer or fall just because right. um, the issues are really intense. Yes. And, uh, it's, you know, we have to be careful not to be glib. Right. And not to speak for others. You know? When uh, when did you start that research for that book? Um, about two years ago. It takes a long time. Yeah. And you know, then, and I have a lot of other jobs. Too. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's right. not like I just get to write my book all day. Like you know, yeah. you have to carve out time to do these things. So what we're going through now between uh, COVID nineteen and um, the 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 rights of of Black Lives, it it really must have given you uh, more fuel. More fuel. Yeah. Did it. Well, it's a reckoning. Yeah. You know, you have to reckon with your own privilege, with your own uh, place within what is basically a dominant discourse, you know, that graphic design is part of the wheels of um, an exclusionary culture. Yeah. Right. So I it's, think that that's um, intense. I think that's one of the biggest things is um, just awareness. I think a lot of people lack awareness of, of you know, the extent of privilege and how it affects people. So you, you've spent two years previously building research. Do you find how much how much of that research do you find that it's like, well, I did that for a month and I guess I shouldn't have went you know, spent that time. Is there a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, the, you know, there's a famous expression, kill your darlings. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's, there's a whole history behind it, but it's, um, it's about being able to let go of things that you've worked on as a writer. Yeah. Your favorite sentence, your favorite character. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's yep. really tough. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, dreading when we run into when we run into that i know we well, will it's the though. cutting room floor you know right. it's like you can't. yes and inevitably you will produce more material than you can use oh, that's goodness. the essence of of a project right. like you're doing yeah and then trying to store all that scene that's going to be all you know digital interviews audio and video and, and whatnot Hey, let me roll that question then into something for all the students that tune into my podcast and listen then um, it seems to be like pulling teeth to get students to do research, whether it's for a paper in our history of graphic design class, or if they're just doing a poster, right? Something as basic as, you know, make your favorite band poster, you know, um, the amount of research or their, 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 uh, their like willingness to to do that back end research. Can you talk a little bit about that? Can I'm I'm hoping for those wonderful Ellen Lupton inspirational words <laughs> that, you know, make young students go, "Oh my gosh, Ellen Lupton said this and now I just need to do it." Well, I have a few, you know, I do a lot of research myself, obviously. Um, one is that you have to see research as part of the creative work, you know, and then, Yeah. Um, it's just part of the part of the job. And when you're in the profession, you have to research like 
uh, users and uh, demographics and competing uh, brands and all that. So, so research is just something we have to do. And then that it's really important to uh, document your research. So if you read a bunch of books and you're not taking notes from those books, you might as well not have read them. So it's better to read less and take notes than to read more and just have a big stack of the books that you read or the articles that you read. So I, I read less. Um, if I, a typical book, I might just read part of it, but I'm reading in a very active way and uh, making intensive notes so that later I just read my notes. I don't have to go back to the book. Yeah. Um, and that's, uh, those are habits you have to get into and you have to see all that note taking and all that organizing of the knowledge as you go along is part of the project. Yeah. So do you find that you need to show students how to conduct research? That's a good question. Um, well, there's so many different kinds of research. So um, in our design history class that I teach with Brock at Horn, Last year, we created a project of debates where students were debating different topics that were relevant to our course. And so they had to develop, you know, evidence and counter evidence for an argument. And so it's very, it's very purposeful. It isn't just collecting facts about right. somebody's life or facts about an art movement. It's actually collecting ideas and positions. So I think just making research purposeful and that it isn't just like a big bucket and you're throwing in as much as you can find, but it's directed towards some kind of communication outcome. Yeah, I found in, um, you know, project work, if I do give them that, like uh, Mandy's saying, that little bit of, of guidance to that end, uh, just to that poster, right? It's a band poster. Well, tell us about the band. What's the band's makeup and what's their audience and where do they play and what kind of things, uh, instruments do they play and, and, and very specifics. So I found if I get them more involved in the exact specificities of, of the project, it seems to help. And it seems to kind of uh, intrigue their research to find out those things because they may choose the band because it's their favorite band. But then when I start asking them all those little questions, it's like, well, well, what's that band's band band members favorite hobby or, or is there a certain passion they have that they like to do on Saturdays or what? And they're, they're like, wow, that's really detailed. And I was like, it is really detailed, but you can really learn a lot about what you're trying to communicate even though you may not use all that, right? It still piques your interest. So you dig in more and you don't just say, well, they're a band that plays rock and roll, you know? So the students really enjoy that a lot. So um, research is obviously very important to this project, but we should probably get back to the topics. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Um, Mandy, did you have a question you wanted to uh, move to? Um. Well, I thought we could go ahead and jump into talking maybe about gender disparity in graphic design. Sure. Sure. So, so, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Just, you know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, is there a gender disparity in graphic design? And if so, what to what extent is that disparity? Um, so, so, yeah. So um, there is, on the one hand, a very high representation of women in art schools. So there's a lot of women studying design, and this has actually always been the case, um, that women have actually had high representation in art schools, even earlier in the 20th century, but they didn't have such high representation professionally. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's a difference between um, accessing the education and um, and then succeeding in the workplace. And then, so then there are structural reasons about expectation of women to be caregivers and so forth that um, have prevented women from being as successful professionally. 
And then, you know, the bigger problem that our profession is must grapple with, and unfortunately has been grappling with for decades, is the lack of racial diversity in graphic design. Mm -hmm. And here we see a much less racially diverse classroom. There's lots of women, but not many yes. people of color. A lot of Asian students increasingly. So you might have a group that has a lot of Asian and white students, but not many um, African-American or Latino or indigenous students. And so that's a, that's a bigger problem. So there you have a very small number and a smaller yes. number that then has an opportunity to go and succeed in the workplace. And this is not a new problem. Right. I encourage you to, for example, Maurice Cherry did an incredible talk in 2013 that you can see on YouTube. And he referenced that. So that's seven years ago. Yeah. And he references things that were being written in 1989, 1991 by AIGA yeah. about um, the lack of minorities in graphic design. So this is like a really old problem. It has not yet been solved and it is, it's very difficult. Yeah. I've noticed that in, in, in my classes, I've, I need I'm to going take a quick my... break here. I'll be right back. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. It's understandable. Our apologies. Uh, our apologies. Um, so with that in mind, I, you know, I'm entering my 12th year of teaching and I have noticed that, that, um, same concerns in, in our classrooms, right? The amount of representation from, from all ethnicities, whether it's black, Asian, or, or white. And it's, it's really difficult. It is really difficult to see that. And then when we look at our graduation rates and we even look at the job placements, you know, of those students, um, it's, it's even more troubling, you know? So I hope it's something that we can, you know, as we move in our profession, um, can, can be well, addressed. Well, it requires work from everybody to address sure. that. So you as a faculty member to um, celebrate the work of these students, um, for employers to more actively seek out candidates from different backgrounds. And then when they're hired to create a work environment that is uh, supportive of actual diversity and isn't just yeah. filling a, a slot. Um, and these are, not, these are not easy things to do and um, everybody has to play a role in addressing it. I agree, I agree. Um, I think that's all that I had, but I think um, Mandy's gonna uh, maybe bring us to one more thing. And then I think that we're almost at the end of the podcast episode. So Mandy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. We understand you're, you're very busy. Um, <laughs> I just, I do want to ask, I'm, I'm a huge fan of your writing. Um, and I've, I love your books and I've read a lot of your articles, especially doing some recent research. Um, and I would hope, I would love for you to talk just a little bit about how writing has really helped you, um, you know, in your career and, you know, in everything that you do, perhaps. I mean, writing is my career. It's like writing is what I do every day. Um, and for me, the design is my subject matter and it's a tool for publishing, whether right. it's creating the presentations or um, laying out books and doing all the production on books or exhibitions, you know, all the design that goes on with that. Um, but, but again, I, I started by saying that writing and design are really connected, that typography is words. Right. Yeah, um, and right. so being able to put all that together is my greatest joy, you know, That's, to be uh, able to combine. I can, I can see it. I can see it in your eyes as you smile over that 
a, yeah, a, a message. Um, and if, if, if anyone listening to the podcast needs to see that, jump over to YouTube and see the YouTube version of the podcast and see Ellen's uh, ginormous smile over her passion <laughs> with writing and typography. Um, hey, before we wrap up, I'm, I, I always ask all my guests, can you give uh, – what message would you give to the students about any, anything in, in that just comes to your mind or something maybe that is very passionate and close to you that you, you like to continually try to echo? Well, to be curious, you know, uh, read, read the news, um, find out about the literature and film from cultures other than yours, uh, go to museums and look at stuff, um, you know, follow the design blogs, they're good, read AIGA Eye on Design, it's really yeah. um, opening up new territory and I always see things there that are new to me uh, and there's always new stuff and new, new ideas and new questions and challenges so, um, so sometimes I feel like my students just aren't curious enough you know they're so focused on what they're doing that they don't um, reach out and um, push boulders over and see what's squirming around underneath yeah. so that's where inspiration comes from I, I think I see that too. They get so hyper focused on their grade, like ah, oh, the grades. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We're all rolling our eyes, like ah, <laughs> that that question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we touched on two of the five things that I bring up in my intro to graphic design class. Uh, I won't go over all five right now, but we already talked about fear and not letting fear stop you from doing the things that you want to do, and to be curious. Always be curious. Um, that curiosity yeah, is going to lead you to be. Um, a better person and a better designer, for sure. Well, Ellen, I can't thank you enough uh, for joining us. Um, regardless of, of interruptions, uh, it's the world we live in. And you're, uh, is he a terrier? He, she? I have two that they make a lot of noise, oh. especially when the doorbell rings. Yeah, they they were fantastic. Uh, um, yes. Beautiful little, little uh, members of our families. But... Uh, it, it was a pleasure and um, man, it was it was just great uh, talking with you, listening um, and just, you know, considering those different things that Mandy and I are going to um, be putting into our research and keeping in mind as we move forward. Oh, so. I'm excited for your film. So thank you for including me in these early stages. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode. The Design Deducts podcast can be found at designdeducts.com. That's D-E-S-I-G-N-D-E-D-U-X.com, where you can listen to the podcast or watch the video version of the podcast, as well as find links to the guests and the topics discussed during each episode. The Design Deducts podcast can be found on most podcast listening platforms. You can join us on social media through Instagram and Twitter via at design underscore deducts on Facebook as Design Deducts Podcast and join us on YouTube at Design Deducts for video versions of each episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, you can show your support on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash design underscore deducts. Once again, thanks for joining us and we hope you'll join us again for the next episode.